All right. Uh, can everyone hear me all right? Okay, cool. Um, so uh, Arunas and I did the Nearshore Fish Community Objective Update. Uh, we decided to kind of divide and conquer, even though he's the chair of the, this uh, FCO. I'll be covering the U.S. water side and the St. Mary's River, which is uh, joint waters. And then Arunas will be covering, after I get done, the Canadian waters. Um, so really quickly, I'll get into the data sets that we utilized for the Nearshore FCO. The first is the U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service early AIS Early Detection Monitoring Survey. Um, essentially what you need to know from this is that we use a multitude of gear to comprehensively sample uh, the nearshore adult and fish, uh, juvenile fish community uh, along the entirety of the Michigan shoreline of Lake Huron. Um, and it's a pretty robust data set dating back to 2013. We have just under half a million fish um, and about 300, about 3,000 units of effort. Um, the, uh, one of the other data sets that we utilized um, is the Michigan DNR gill netting and trawling survey data. Um, this is uh, uh, down in Saginaw Bay. And I would suggest if you have questions pertaining to this specific data set to talk with uh, Dave Fielder as he was the one that provided this. And then the St. Mary's River Fish Community Index Netting Survey, um, which is a long-term data set and essentially just uses uh, gill nets to look at the, uh, the fish community. And I would suggest talking to Lisa O'Connor, who's chairing the St. Mary's River Fisheries Task Group, who provided this data set. Okay, so the first part of the nearshore FCO is in regards to centrarchids, uh, sustaining smallmouth and largemouth bass, and the remaining assemblage of some fishes at recreationally attractive levels over their natural range. So, um, the first thing I wanted to do was kind of break it out into lake-wide U.S. waters, all the way down from uh, all the way from the St. Mary's River down to uh, Saginaw Bay, and as you can see. Um, over the course of uh, the previous reporting period, which is over on the, uh, the left-hand side to the current reporting period over on the right-hand side, we've had what might be considered some increases um, in Centrarca's lake-wide uh, in U.S. waters, but uh, it can be kind of variable. As you can see, we had some down years in 2019, 2020. Could be due to um, COVID, but essentially this catch for unit effort is on the y-axis. Um, we considered it increasing, potentially stable. In Saginaw Bay, uh, specifically, we've had some pretty, uh, in pretty significant increases uh, with the Fish and Wildlife Service data as far as catch per unit effort of centrarchids. Um, and this is kind, this kind of um, aligns with maybe what Michigan DNR is, is looking at or is catching with their catch per unit effort in their gill net and trawling surveys, um, as well as their percent of the total catch that they're getting. And so we considered this uh, increasing these populations in Saginaw Bay. In the St. Mary's River, um, we have some high years, we have some down years. Um, it's, a, it's quite variable um, depending on year to year. Again, looking at um, with Fish and Wildlife Service data and then the um, Fisheries Community Index Netting Survey data. Again, it's variable, maybe stable. Um, we considered this fairly stable. We can't really say if it's increasing or de decreasing populations in the St. Mary's River. The next portion of the nearshore FCO would be the channel catfish and the other ictalurids. So maintain channel catfish as a prominent predator throughout its natural range while sustaining a harvestable annual surplus of 0.2 million kilograms. Um, I apologize, I don't have the, the harvest data to present, but I do have population trend data to present. Um, so based off the Fish and Wildlife Service data, um, uh, lake-wide U.S. waters, um, we can see again, it's quite variable. The cutoff is right here. Um, at 2017, 2018. 2019 was a pretty strong year for capturing uh, channel catfish and other ictalurids, but it's been a pretty big drop off since then. So um, it's quite variable year to year. We can't really say if it's increasing or decreasing. But looking at Saginaw Bay, um, again, same thing. Uh, catch per unit effort is pretty variable from year to year with Fish and Wildlife Service data. And then Michigan DNR data, it's a little bit more stable with the catch per unit effort and then the percent of the total catch but again, we consider this maybe stable, quite variable, um, really kind of depends on how you're looking at the data. With the St. Mary's River data, um, again, we had some down years uh, over in 2018, 2019, 2020, but then we had some pretty um, large increases in our catch per unit effort with the ictalurids and the channel catfish in 21, 22, and then this past year in 23. And then the fish community index netting survey data 
Um, again, quite variable from year to year. In 2017, um, there was quite a high catch per unit effort, uh, but in 2022, that dropped off to less than half of what it was in 2017. And then the uh, percent biomass of what's being captured in the St. Mary's River is uh, maintained a relatively low percent biomass of ictalurids captured in the St. Mary's River Community Index Netting Surveys. So we consider this quite variable from year to year. And then the last one, a uh, portion of the near shore that I'll cover before I hand it over to Arunas will be Asasids. So maintaining uh, northern pike as a prominent predator throughout its natural range and maintaining muskie in numbers and at sizes that will safeguard and enhance its special status and appeal and sustain a harvestable annual surplus of 0.1 million kilograms uh, of these assassins, of both of these. Um, so looking at the population trends for assassins in U.S. waters lake-wide, um, we can see that it's remained fairly stable over the course of time. Uh, typically less than 0.2 uh, fish were captured per unit effort over time. In Saginaw Bay, we've had some pretty variable year to year. Um, some years we didn't capture assassins at all in the Fish and Wildlife Service data, um, and other years we did. And then looking at the Michigan DNR data, they've captured them every year, but in pretty variable numbers. In 2018, um, had a larger catch per unit effort than any of the more recent years here. So we thought that that was um, quite variable, potentially stable population sizes. And then in the same areas over, it's a little bit of a different story. Um, both with the Fish and Wildlife Service data with the catch per unit effort, as well as the Fish Community Index Netting surveys, um, we're seeing some potential increases in assassins in the St. Mary's River. And then with that, I'll hand it over to Arunas to cover the Canadian waters. Hey, thanks for hanging around. Let's uh, shift our focus to Ontario waters. Uh, you've already heard about the broad scale monitoring program, so I won't go too much into that, other than to say that that's one of the data sets that's being summarized here. The other data set is uh, what's referred to as the end of spring trap netting, uh, live, trap, live capture trap nets uh, set in shallow waters, uh, two to four meter depths, usually in late spring. So you're going to see summaries from these two survey types, the broad scale monitoring, graded mesh gill net, depth stratified, versus the late spring live capture trap nets that are strictly in near shore waters. So you can see the distribution of sampling areas for the broad scale monitoring. And then I've highlighted in the green ovals, the area sampled with the trap net gear. And you can see that it's primarily restricted to the extensive littoral shelf in Eastern Georgian Bay and into the North Channel. Okay, enough about survey methodologies. So I'm not gonna go over the fish community objective for St. Charkids, other than to highlight my mug over there with a small <laughs> mug. So I'm gonna go over a number of slides, or sorry, a number of graphs. And you've seen something similar to this already in the Perkid uh, presentation. So what I have here and I'm gonna be summarizing four indicators. Catch per unit effort by number, catch per unit effort by biomass, percent composition by number, and percent composition biomass. Okay, so we're gonna start with centrarchids, and we have smallmouth bass in this gold color, and the other centrarchids in this light blue, and the dark bars are all the other species captured during these surveys. And as you heard earlier, we have the BSM starting in 2014 up until 2022. Georgian Bay, North Channel, Main Basin. So, you might ask yourself, well, what's the other central orchid category? It's primarily rock bass with a few black crappie, pumpkin seed, and bluegill thrown in for good measure. But you can see from the BSM catch per unit effort, smallmouth bass are the dominant centrarchid, particularly in Georgian Bay, less so in the North Channel and Main Basin. If we look at the biomass, catch per unit effort biomass, you could see how much more prominent smallmouth bass are. 
and in some surveys they represent a fairly substantial proportion of the total catch. So much more prominent in Georgian Bay, less so in the North Channel and the main basin. And if we look at percent composition by number, again, smallmouth bass very prominent, less so in the North Channel, less so in the main basin. And if we look at biomass, smallmouth bass are pretty significant. In some surveys, they represent uh, close to 35% of the biomass sampled with these particular surveys. And I should qualify these results as well. So within a given year, we don't sample the same areas consecutively. So we might miss some of the local and regional characteristics of fish communities. So we summarize by basin by year. So we might miss some of the nuances of what's happening within specific localities. But you get a general impression that smallmouth bass are pretty important component of the fish community in the broad scale monitoring program. The trends are quite variable, however consistent. You see consistent representation of smallmouth bass in particular in the fish community. Now I'm going to shift over to the trap net results. Um, again, I'm looking at Georgian Bay and the North Channel and this data set goes back to uh, 1998 and it was skewed in the early years towards southern Georgian Bay, Severn Sound in particular. We know that that area is particularly productive for the nearshore fish community and we have a productivity gradient from the south to the north of Georgian Bay. Less productive in the north, more productive in the south. So again, smallmouth bass and gold. Light blue is the other centrarchids. And what you're going to see here in terms of catch per unit effort biomass is that in some locations you get a green bar as well. Those are largemouth bass. So largemouth bass aren't as widely distributed as smallmouth, but in some locations they represent a fairly significant component of the centrarchid fish community. And if we look at the proportion of total catch, in some locations you get heavy representation of other centrarchids. In this case, in Severn Sound, it's primarily rock bass and black crappie. And in recent years, you could see that smallmouth bass are still fairly prominent in Georgian Bay, a little less so in the North Channel. And if we look at biomass, fairly consistent representation of smallmouth bass biomass, particularly in Georgian Bay, a little less so in the North Channel. So the overall assessment of that indicator is it's variable, but we still get consistent representation, particularly of smallmouth bass throughout the nearshore areas. Channel catfish. I've added brown bullhead to this presentation because people don't talk about bullhead enough. And they are pretty prominent in the fish community. So if we look at BSM, the brown color is for brown bullheads and the lighter, the orange is for channel catfish. And you can see that we don't encounter channel cats very frequently in any of the basins using the broad scale monitoring. And when you look at biomass, uh, catch per unit effort biomass, it's the ictalurids are not as prominent as the rest of the fish community. If you look percent composition by number, again, in the BSMs, brown bullhead are there, but they're quite variable in terms of abundance, and you don't encounter channel catfish very fre frequently. And when you do, their biomass is, you know, fairly substantial, but less than 10% of overall fish biomass. And there's not a lot of variability between the various basins, Georgian Bay, North Channel, and Main Basin. So, in terms of the assessment of this indicator, it's quite variable. Ictalurids don't seem to be very prominent in the broad scale monitoring program. However, when you go to the trap nets, live capture gear in the spring, you get a bit of a different picture. You can see that brown bullheads are quite prominent in certain locations. Like in Severn Sound, it's the major benthivore in terms of number caught. When you look at biomass, you could see that brown bullhead are prominent in Georgian Bay 
and then you get that orange bar representation there. That's the channel catfish. Where they are caught, they're relatively large, particularly in the spring. What we're doing is we're encountering these large spawning size channel catfish in the trap nets. And where we're catching them is usually associated with large tributary systems draining into eastern Georgian Bay and the North Channel. So they seem to be on a spawning run per se. When you look at percent composition by number, you can see that in some locations, brown bullhead are quite prominent. Uh, even channel catfish in terms of numbers are, are quite prominent in parts of Georgian Bay. You can see that the uh, abundance varies over time. And when you look at biomass, hmm, this is pretty surprising. In Georgian Bay, in some locations, in some years, channel catfish biomass is approaching 50% of the entire fish biomass. So that's pretty significant. And we don't really think too much about the ecological role of channel catfish in the fish community. You get adults approaching 10 to 15 kilos, like that's a big predator. And it must have some impact on near shore fish community dynamics. So you can see that in Georgian Bay, they're more prominent than in the North Channel. Oh, is that the yellow light of near death? Okay, I, I better get going. So indicator variable. Okay, let's finish up with esosids. Again, not encountered very frequently in the broad scale monitoring. Um, you could see uh, northern pike much more prominent, the muscalunge. In terms of biomass, or catch per unit effort biomass, a little more presence of northern pike. When you look at percent composition, fairly consistent, a little more prominent in Georgian Bay than in the North Channel and the Main Basin. And when you look at biomass, when you do catch pike, they're fairly large individuals, and they are present in the fish community. You even see some representation from muscalunge uh, in the BSM, but not very frequently. So mostly Georgian Bay, less so North Channel, less so in the main basin. So variable, but present. If we look at the trap net data, again, numerically not very abundant in either the North Channel or Georgian Bay. When you look at catch per unit, catch per unit effort by weight, a little more pronounced and you get some representation from muscalunge. And when you look at percent composition, fairly consistent, mostly northern pike in terms of numbers. And when you look at in terms of biomass, you get some locations where muscalunge do appear. So there is that consistent representation, particularly in Georgian Bay and in the North Channel, but it is variable. So, I mentioned, did I mention how difficult it is to capture muscalunge in any of these surveys? Well, I'm hopefully gonna be able to show a video. Just pretend that there's dramatic music. Apparently I don't have any audio. But we were able to get a documentary crew to do some filming last spring in a secret location in Northern Georgia Bay. And we just happen to have a great Net lift. Wow. Oh. No. The audio oh here would be oh man, look at all those muskies. That's amazing. Hey, look at that. 9.4. Wow. That fish weighed 8.3 kilos. 10 thirds. So this is just kind of the sampling regime that we go through. We process them quite quickly. And this documentary crew had an ROV, had a drone high resolution film camera as well. 13 and like 10. I was just beside myself. Look at that. Look at fish. Wow. Just another day on the job. Yeah. <laughs> 1200. Good. 1270. More dramatic music. Look at that. Very smooth. I almost tripped that. But incredible uh, resolution to, to the filming. I've been waiting 30 years to get some profile for this muscle. 8.9. Finally! But I don't have the audio.
So hopefully this provides you with a bit of a glimpse into our nearshore monitoring and assessment program. Uh, right at the end of the video, that concluding shot. Look at that. Look at those beautiful fish. Seven musky and in a single trap. Wonderful to done. see. Seven musky in one trap net set. All too clear. Coming out to your local theater this spring. Watch it, please. And I think that's all I've got. Just.